Thank you for joining us on our online campus. This weekend we kick off a new sermon series called Come Back. And we're going to take a look at the life of Peter and actually discover how our setbacks can become the setup for God to make our lives his next comeback story. So we hope you're ready for this one. For me, the injuries I have had in football, the major injuries, um, I broke my leg. I thought that was going to be it for me in football. Um, and especially um, two seasons ago, I tore my Achilles tendon. Um, and doing that, people said, well, Greg, you know, even the doctor thought that that was going to be it. I thought that that was going to be it for me in football. Um, people said, well, is age going to really hurt him coming off of that kind of injury? He'll never get back. Um, my football team also drafted a first round draft pick at my position uh, because they felt like, you know, that's probably going to be it for Greg. It was, it was some real down times. Inevitably, in every one of our lives, we experience setbacks. Maybe for you, it was a setback in a career. Maybe you could relate to Greg and you, you went through something that changed your occupation or your profession. Maybe you went through a financial setback and you found yourself in a crisis. For others of you, your setback was more relational. Maybe a, a friendship that fell apart or a betrayal or a rejection or maybe a broken promise that left you feeling set back in your confidence in relationships. Your home fell apart. Maybe, maybe it's just an emotional setback or something going on in your mind or your attitude that leaves you feeling incredibly broken. And here's what setbacks do. Setbacks create a void in our heart and life. There's this empty space, you could call it a vacuum, where a dream or a relationship or a hope or a profession or finances once filled that space, when you experience a setback, now there is a void and an emptiness. And what do you use to fill the emptiness? How do you fill the voids and the vacuums in your life? For many of us, when we experience a setback, we fill the void with frenetic activity. We get busy. We get consumed with consuming in life. We, we fill it with pleasures and passions. We, we get caught up in our desires and we leverage distractions to preoccupy us and numb the pain left and created by the voids in our heart and life. And so we find ourselves numbing ourselves with addictions and life-controlling habits and behaviors. And when you experience a setback that creates emptiness, that you fill with those kind of activities, they leave you believing that your best days are behind you. It's a setback that causes me to believe that my best relationships, the best career moments I've had, the best memories I've made are all behind me, and now I am settling for this ordinary activity. I am numbing the pain, and I'm going to have to numb it until life comes to an end. But somewhere deep inside, while we're busy numbing the pain, while we're busy filling the empty with the ordinary, we believe deep inside of us that we were created for something more, that there's more to life than the busy, there's more to life than the numb, there's more to life than this addiction, that somewhere deep inside, this is not the way life was meant to be lived, and I believe that my life could be more, that I am worth more, and that I could accomplish more. So I wanna bring you to a, a story Found in the Bible, but let me set it up. Uh, it was written by a guy named Luke. Luke, who's an author, who is an eyewitness account of the life of Jesus. Luke uh, is one of the outsiders in a, in a religion of insiders who begins to follow Jesus, and he, he becomes familiar with the life and teachings of Jesus. And then he goes and he studies the stories and the life of Jesus, and he records it in what later becomes known as the Gospel According to Luke the life and teachings of Jesus from the eyewitness perspective in the study of Luke. Luke records a moment where there's a family in need of a comeback. More importantly, one of the family members needs a comeback. And so let me, let me give you a little bit more background to it. Uh, the story is this. There is this family uh, with a dad named John who starts a fishing business. 
John uh, does well enough that he begins to employ his sons, Andrew and Simon, and eventually even buys another boat and had employees who now work for him. So now he's got these two boats that go out fishing and he, he leverages the haul of his catch to keep the business running and even to pay his sons and employees. His sons couldn't be any more different. As any parent knows, you have kids that are nothing alike, completely different life and personalities and, and interests, and, and that's Andrew and Simon. Andrew is your deep thinker. He, he's the contemplative child. He's the quiet one that kind of walks out into the woods and you never really quite know where they're at. And, and when you look in their eyes, they're always far away. They're like, they're in their own world thinking deep, profound things. You're, that's your child that you're pretty convinced is smarter than you are. And, and that's Andrew. Andrew... Um, he, he's a little quieter, not, not quite what you'd expect of a fisherman. He's a deep thinker. He's devoted, religiously devoted. And so when he hears about this uh, up-and-coming teacher, also named John, Andrew becomes one of his students. Andrew follows John, who later becomes known as John the Baptizer, around. He becomes a follower in and disciple of John, and John is teaching, calling people to return to God and repent of their old way of living. One day, as Andrew is following John, John introduces them to a guy named Jesus, and he says, look, from now on, I want you to stop following me, and I want you to start following Jesus. Very quickly, Andrew is taken by this teacher named Jesus, and so he goes home, while he's working, he's talking with Simon, his brother, about Jesus, and Simon's far less interested. See, now Simon is your typical fisherman. He is the prototypical sailor. He's got the mouth of a sailor. He's got that blue-collar grit of a sailor. He's the hard worker. He's got the blood and the sweat and the scars to prove it. He, he speaks first and then thinks about what he just said. Uh, he gets himself into trouble at work with his wife, and uh, Peter, you know, or Simon, you and I, we kind of like him because we relate to him. Now, some of y'all, you're the deep thinker Andrews, and we so appreciate you. You're awesome. But mo I think most of us, we can appreciate Simon because we feel like we're a little rough and tumble, saying the wrong thing, getting ourselves into trouble. And, and Simon really doesn't take a whole lot of interest in what interests Andrew, as any typical brother would do. That's good for you, not good for me. But one day, Andrew's interests intersect Simon's life. They go out fishing all night with their dad and, the other, and their other boat, and they fish all night, and they've caught nothing. Talk about frustration. Talk about an emptiness that's created by a setback. When you spend your whole night fishing, and this is your business, imagine you just labored for a week trying to complete a contract, and at the end of the contract, you, you realize that you're in the red by the amount of money you were supposed to make, meaning you, you've, you've got costs piling up, and now you're going to make nothing out of this job. That's a setback. You're in trouble, and that's where they find themselves, and Andrew's life intersects with Simon's life. We're going to jump into Luke chapter 5, verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God. So here's Jesus over here. This huge crowd has followed him. This huge crowd's listening to him teach the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. Jesus strikes up a conversation with the family, and Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night, and we've, we haven't caught anything and very quickly you see the setback in these guys lives they've spent their life toiling in futility it's not that a fishing business is bad in fact when business is good it's a pretty lucrative business hard work but it makes great money but the problem is they're in an economic recession the fish have receded and they're not doing very well and so they need a comeback but right now, Simon is frustrated, and he's telling Jesus, the master, hey, look, we've been working all night. We haven't caught anything. And so here's what they're doing. They're now mending their nets. So the story goes, here's Jesus over here teaching to the crowds. Everybody's pressing in and listening. Over here are the two boats, and the fishermen are working, mending the nets that got torn as they spent the night fishing. 
Similarly, you and I, when we spend our life in futility, when we experience setbacks, we begin to settle. We begin to settle for the activity and the busyness and the pleasures and the passions of our own making and creating. And so we settle for less than what God designed our life to be. And so my challenge to you be this. Hopefully you're taking notes today. In your program, there's a place to take notes. In the study guide that we gave out, there's a place to take notes. Feel free to use a smartphone or a tablet. You can put this right into your um, social media. You can even feel free to Facebook Live this. If you're online with us, you can use your, the chat section to take notes. Here's what I want you to write down. Don't settle for, or, or, yeah, don't settle for less than best. Very often, when we experience setbacks, we settle for numbing the pain. We settle for busyness and activity that just makes us feel better. But as a result, we simply numb the pain and we, we anesthetize the hurts in our lives And we do not experience the very best that our life has to offer. We settle for less. And Simon is telling Jesus, leave us alone. I'll stick with mending the torn nets. He's settling for less than God has for him. My challenge to you is I would invite you to make a shift from pursuing, filling your ordinary empty nets filling the emptiness to an extraordinary comeback. Your life can become a great comeback story. But how do you make a comeback? For many of us, we think we're going to have our comeback through a lot of hard work, through a lot of labor. If we, if we just buckle down, if I get more education, if I work longer hours, if I just try harder with my spouse, if I just You know, if I get better at what I'm currently doing, I'll make a comeback. And that's not what's going to turn our life around. In the story, Jesus, after he finished his teaching, we're going to pick it up in verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, here's what I want to do. I want to to give you a comeback, Simon. It goes like this. Put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon, his brother Andrew, his dad John, their employees in the other boat, they've worked hard all night. And now Jesus says, I want you to get back in your boat. I want you to go back out in the lake. I want you to put down your nets, the ones you're busy mending, and I want you to get ready for a catch. And there is this moment when I think all of us are confronted by Jesus. Simon answered, We've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Here's what we recognize in this story. God will allow your setbacks to become a set up so you can make a comeback. God is using your setbacks. He used the empty nets in Simon's life to catch his attention. If they had caught a bunch of fish that night, they would have had little interest in being obedient to Jesus. The the message of Jesus, the challenge of Jesus would not have been as captivating. But because they had fished all night and caught nothing, they experienced a setback that set them up for a comeback. God wants to use the setbacks in your life to set you up for a comeback story. So what are the setbacks? Where's the empty nets in your life? What are you using Where are you busy mending? Because in the story, right, as they went out fishing, the nets get torn. Life tears at you. Inevitably, when you're going through the ordinary of life and you're numbing and anesthetizing the pain, eventually it's going to tear at your heart. It's going to tear at your dreams. It's going to tear at your emotions. It's going to tear at your mind and your thinking and your attitude. And it's going to leave your nets torn. And so then you spend the morning hours mending the nets from the night before. And I imagine there are plenty of you who have spent morning hours mending the pain you encountered from the night before. And Jesus wants to meet you right in that place where you've been torn at the core. 
where you're busy trying to repair the, the empty nets in your life. And Jesus says, hey, let's go back out and let's go fishing. Your setbacks are a setup for you to make a comeback. And so my challenge to you is this. I want you to write this down. I can make a comeback. I'm going to challenge you simply to make a comeback. For you to become a comeback story. How? Let's keep reading. Here, here's how this story is going to make a turn. When they had done so, meaning when they went back out to go fishing again. They fished all night. They've caught nothing. They're at shore. Jesus is teaching. They're busy cleaning up the tares and trying to mend the empty nets. When they had done so, check this out. They caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so full that the boats began to sink. This is a career-defining catch. Think about it. Fishermen who have fished all night and caught nothing now go back out at the command of the Master Jesus and immediately when they throw their nets out, their nets are instantly filled so full that they have to signal the other boat to come and they begin to pour they, they begin to like try to heap the fish in they try to drag these nets in and as they're dragging them in with the, the boats the literally the fish are so heavy there's so many that it's pulling the ships these boats down this is like something you wish you could see on like you know one of those reality shows Th this is a life changing career altering catch this is the the big one this is the big contract this is the one where you got to go out and purchase new equipment you've got to get all new software this is the one where you got to start em hiring employees this rewrites the story of your business and your life but what i appreciate is that jesus uses a catch of fish to catch their attention because the point of the story is not the catch of fish. It's that Jesus intersects them at the place of their emptiness and their brokenness. He uses a catch of fish to tell them this, to show them, look, at any point, I could fill the empty nets. What is making you empty is not empty nets. What's really torn in your life are not the empty nets. There's something much deeper that is empty, and there's something far more broken than just your nets. It's not your career that's the problem. It's not your finances that are in ruins that's the problem. It's not the relationships or the home that's falling apart. It's not the work relationships. It's not the friendships that are failing that is torn and broken and empty. There is something deeper in your life and my life that needs a comeback. And that's where the story continues. Here is what's going on. Jesus leverages the catch of fish to catch their attention, to show them that there's something more to life than just fishing. There's something more to their life than just trying to be successful in their business. Now, this is where most of us would love for Jesus to meet us. This is how most of us use God. Think about when you pray. Think about when you've been most willing to turn to God. Isn't it when you wanted God to do something for you? Maybe a marriage or relationship was falling apart and you went, God, I need you to fill my empty nets. And they, they're kind of get, they kind of get the moment where they get everything they dream of. God fills their empty nets. And most people want to stop right there. God, would you give me what I want? Would you give me that promotion? Give me that spouse? Would you heal my home? Would you fix this? Would you do that? And right there is where most of us want to stop the story, but that's not where it stops. In fact, that's not even the point of the story. We're going to keep reading verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees. He come back to shore. He's looking at this huge catch of fish, and he realizes, we didn't catch this fish. We didn't do anything to earn this. We labored all night, and we caught nothing, and now we've got this life and business-altering catch that we did nothing to work for. This is, this is something different. We chased fish. God brought the fish to us. This is 
life changing. And he falls at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. Here is what happens. God used a catch of fish to catch their attention to show them that they not only needed to make a comeback, but that their life was far more in trouble than they had at any other point realized. They thought the problem was their empty nets and the torn nets. When in reality, what Jesus is doing is revealing to Simon, Simon, you got a deeper problem. Your problem is not empty nets, but emptiness. Your problem is not torn nets, but a very torn heart. Here is what is at work in every one of our hearts. Our lives are sabotaged by sin. The word Simon used, get away from me, I am sinful. Specifically what this means. There is a driving force inside of every one of our lives, a driving force that is at work wrecking our lives, and it's called sin. Sin sabotages our life. Sin is what pushes us to live the way we want to live in the opposite direction of God. God is giving us a pathway, a a, a direction. God gives us the laws and the commands to live the best life possible and a blessed life. And we disregard that because there is this sabotaging force inside of us called sin that drives us toward numbing desires, toward life filling, life consuming, but really nothing more than life numbing addictions, desires, and habits. Sin cuts us off from relationship with God, leaving us in a place where we do nothing but numb it, leaving us ruined, ruining relationships, ruining careers, ruining our finances, but worse, sin leaves us on a crash course trajectory with eternal judgment. The consequence for living a life driven by the sabotaging force of sin is that we are on our way to a forever far away from God in judgment and punishment. But God intervened in our story. The takeaway for you is that making a comeback is impossible on your own. You and I need to follow the example of Peter where we fall at Jesus' knees and say, I don't deserve this. I deserve you to reject me. Get away from me. I am a sinner living a self-sabotaging life. But in the greatest comeback story ever told, God, looking down on the mess of our lives, looking down on the emptiness and the tears in our lives, intervened in our story. God became one of us. Jesus Christ comes to earth to take the death sentence that was placed on each one of us as an eternal judgment for our sin. Jesus took it collectively on himself. Jesus willingly went to a cross. He willingly took on capital punishment, the death sentence for us. But not just a physical death, He was willing to be rejected by God the Father. He was willing to endure eternal suffering as the payment for our sin so that in Jesus, the full punishment for sin was paid in full. So that when Jesus died, he died once for all. But Jesus not only died and was buried in a tomb, but three days later, Jesus supernaturally, miraculously, and physically erupted out of that tomb fully back to life, resurrected, the greatest comeback story ever written, where the God-man who paid for our sin is now back to life, and in his resurrection, the grip of sin that was in every one of our lives is loosed. The power of death was broken, and the consequence of eternal judgment freed from our life trajectory, so that in Jesus' resurrection, not only did he make a comeback, but he makes a comeback available for every single one of us. So my challenge to you is, you want to make a comeback? Make a comeback by coming back to God. What does Peter do? He falls at Jesus' knees. He says, get away from me, I'm a sinful man. But Jesus doesn't leave him there. Jesus receives that repentance forgives him of sin and when you come to God and you're looking at God and you're going God I'm my life is a mess my my life isn't just empty nets and torn nets my life is emptiness and a torn heart God I don't deserve this God my life is falling apart but when you come back to God in repentance through faith in Jesus Christ he receives that repentance and he gives you new life through faith in Jesus Christ he his invisible 
eternal spirit comes. You can't, you don't necessarily feel it, but his spirit intersects with your spirit. And when God's spirit enters into your spirit, you become truly and supernaturally alive so that now the life of God is in you. And now your life, instead of being on a crash course trajectory with eternal judgment, is now on course toward eternal life in paradise with God forever. When you make, when you join God through faith in Jesus, you begin to make a comeback story by coming back to God. I want to show you a little bit what that looks like. We, uh, we're going to show you a little more of Greg's story of how his life began to make a comeback. Check this out. God just had a different plan. He blessed me to be the um, comeback player of the year for the NFL. Uh, blessed me to have more sacks than I ever had in my career. Um, doing all of that, blessed me, blessed me to make my first Pro Bowl even. Uh, you know, it, when that happened, I can't take the credit for it. The doctors can't take the credit. The coaches can't take the credit. Um, all fingers have to point and say, man, if you follow this guy's story, you follow what happened to him, uh, you have to realize that there is a God and he does show up and do miracles. My faith in Jesus is everything. It is my life. It just doesn't impact my life. Uh, and I don't say that being boastfully, but everything I do in my life, I always seek God first. Um, and not to say that I'm perfect and I make all the right decisions, uh, but I base everything I do in my life off of Christ. I truly strive to make sure I'm doing it Jesus' way, putting Him first and letting people see that. Every time I'm blessed to make a play, if you notice, I'll, I'll get up and I'll point both fingers to the sky. I get teased by it, and God said, why don't you get another celebration dance? And I'm like, man, all the things I've been through in my life, every time I go on the field, every play I'm blessed to make, I always want to acknowledge God, and that's what I do. I appreciated Greg sharing his story because I think it really parallels Simon's. In this, the comeback in his life was not about coming back to his NFL career. Yes, he came back to it. But God leveraged the setbacks as a setup so he can make a comeback story in his relationship with Jesus. God wants to use the setbacks in your life as a setup so you can make a comeback to faith in Jesus. And as you come back to faith in Jesus, as you come into relationship with God, God begins to turn the story of your life around and he will begin to use whatever life experience you have as a platform. God wants to take the rest of your story, the rest of your experience, and begin to transform it for his purposes like he did in Greg's life. And so let me give you the, the, the challenge that your first step, it is impossible for you to make a comeback on your own, but through faith in Jesus Christ, your first comeback is a comeback to God, and then God begins to rewrite your story so that your story is not about you. It's not about you making a name for yourself. It's not about you filling your empty nets. It's not about how great of a fisherman you are. What I love about the story of Simon is that they never get the chance to write a book about how you catch a business changing catch of fish right because they can't say this is what we did the only thing they did was obeyed Jesus the whole story turns around and then there's this next moment and so here, here's what I want you to continue as you're taking notes this is what you're going to write not only must we make in order to make a comeback we have to come back to God but when we make a comeback to God we make a comeback by coming back to our God-made purposes. See, when you come back to Jesus, and you come into faith in Jesus Christ, and the God's spirit intersects with your spirit, his spirit alive in you, he begins to reignite in you the purposes that he put in you from the moment you were conceived in your mother's womb. Some of you, you have carried deep woundedness because of things people have spoken negatively over you, 
Or maybe just what you fundamentally believed about yourself from the time you were very young. Maybe you thought you were worthless or you thought you couldn't amount to anything or maybe you felt like you couldn't accomplish anything or maybe you've carried the negativity of words that were spoken over your life. But when, you, when your life is reignited through faith in Jesus Christ and God's spirit lives in your spirit, God begins to re-stir up in you this sense that I was created for something more than ordinary. My life could be significant my life can matter here is what here's how that moment plays out in Simon's life then Jesus said to Simon don't be afraid from now on you will catch men so they pulled their boats up on shore left everything and followed him now what Jesus does is he uses a catch of fish to catch their attention so he could capture their life purpose the catch of catching men was just a metaphor to say Simon I want to use you to change the world. People are the world. People matter to me. I want to use you to become an influencer where you're going to throw the net of hope out and you're going to draw people in to new life. And just like I showed you that I'm the one that draws the fish to the net, I am going to work through you and I'm going to draw people into the net of new life. Peter, I want to, uh, Simon, I want to use you that way. Here's the point. God had designed Simon for a purpose, for meaning, for significance, and he was busy doing something other than living his God-given destiny. And while you and I are busy chasing emptiness, trying to fill the empty voids of our heart and life, trying to mend the tears, God is using those setbacks to get our attention. Here, I want to, I want to challenge you with this. Where the setbacks create emptiness, a hollow. The hollow exists to tell you there is more ahead. Most of us pull back from the hollow, from the echo. We feel uncomfortable in that empty space because it, it feels scary, it feels dangerous, it feels like we don't have value. But I assure you that when you get into a hollow hallway what it's telling you is there's something further ahead keep going god wants to use the setbacks in your life where you feel an emptiness to capture your attention, to tell you there is more ahead. God is setting you up for a comeback and your comeback is gonna coincide with you beginning to live your God-made purpose. That means you have to begin to discover and put your life into God-designed destiny rather than man-made desires. What are you pursuing that is of your own making? You gotta lay that aside. What is the agenda you're following that is of your own writing? That is not what you were created for. And begin to fill your life with God-made purpose as you walk through faith in Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you, each one of you as you came in, we gave you a little card. And we want to, we want to encourage every one of you uh, to continue this conversation. We, we, we've tried to set this whole series up, this comeback series as a way where you can be part of the conversation. And so uh, when you came in, you got a little card. It, it talks about, it has the information about life groups on it. Here's what we, we believe that, that conversations happen best in circles rather than rows. You're sitting in rows right now, or maybe you're sitting at a, a computer watching this online, and we, we believe that while this is powerful and meaningful for you to come to a place of worship and where your life can be transformed in a gathering of the church, we also believe that conversations happen best in circles. And so I want to encourage every one of you, would you make a commitment right now that for the next six weeks, you're going to join the conversation. You're going to get into a group where you're going to hang out with some people and you're going to have a conversation about how your lives can become part of the comeback story. So here's what I'm actually do right now. I'm gonna encourage you to fill out those cards and on your way out, you're gonna drop those cards in the uh, boxes, the giving boxes, because we wanna see every single one of you get plugged into a group where you can have this conversation. Now, as you're filling those out, don't, don't check out on me just yet, all right? As you're having this conversation, as you're thinking about how your life can become part of that comeback story, there are some of you that you're going to need to make some decisions today. And so I want to invite you to first pause and you allow God's spirit to begin to stir your heart. What decisions need to begin to be made? 
What commitment do you need to make in order to see your life become part of that comeback story? Would you take a moment right now and just let the Spirit of God begin to speak to your heart? We hope that this story has challenged your story to be a comeback. Today, if you made the decision to give your life to Jesus, will you please let us know? We wanna pray for you and encourage you. You can let us know you made that decision by clicking on the prayer tab. Click on the prayer tab if there's anything you would like us to pray about for you. Also, if this ministry has been a blessing to you, we encourage you, partner with us. You can give to LifeHouse financially by clicking on the Give tab and give to what God is doing here in LifeHouse and around the world. Well, we hope that you'll join us again next week as we continue week two of Comeback.